First of all, Sam, thank you very much for joining us this evening. It's a privilege for me to welcome you not as a guest, but as a member of our family. Sam has a well-earned reputation as an international and respected telecom inventor, management guru, and entrepreneur. This reputation has been built over many years in the telecom and IT industry all over the world. His experience travels corporate, technological, management, and sociological worlds. It would take me the whole afternoon to read Mr. Petrada's complete curriculum, so I will just go over some highlights of Sam's career. He is currently chairman of WorldTel Limited, an international telecom union initiative to help mobilize development on telecommunication sector in developing countries. He is founding chairman of the Telecom Commission in the Government of India. He founded several companies in the United States and Europe, including Westcom, which, one, which was one of the first digital switching companies in the world. He owns over 50 worldwide patents, including Digital Dairy, which was used by several global companies. He is credited with having laid the foundation and ushered in India's technology revolution in the 1980s as technology advisor to the Prime Minister of India. So Sam, to start this presentation, I would like to introduce a little idea. I think we can draw many parallels between India and Mexico. One of them is that India has to become much more knowledge intensive in everything they produce, much faster than the West did back in its day, in order to grow faster with fewer resources. And I think that's the same challenge we are facing here in Mexico. So, Sam, please. Thank you. I might as well get up. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It is indeed a pleasure to be here. Coming to Etam is like coming home in Mexico City. I've been here many times. I have several friends here, and it is good to be with you. I just asked your colleague as to what do you want me to talk about? And he said, if you can just talk more about technology and education and how IT and technology. All right, so that's good. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. So I thought I just share with you some random thoughts for about 20 minutes or so, and then maybe we can have a little, little interaction. Technology has indeed changed the global landscape from the viewpoint of economic development, social development, and political development. Technology is not something about urban, elite, exotic, fancy, expensive, intimidating. Technology is all about problem solving. How do you solve a problem and what do you use to solve that problem to reduce cost, improve efficiency, productivity, and access? Just look at what has happened to mobile telephony. Just in a very short period of time, less than almost 20 years, four billion people in this world have mobile telephones. It took us over 110 years to get to less than billion landlines. And in 20 years, we have four billion telephones. And we believe that by 12, 13, which is or 2013, which is three years from now, the world will have six billion cell phones. That means everyone would be connected in some fashion. This has been possible mainly because of one, more innovation, reduced cost, improved efficiency, better coverage, and easier to install, maintain service. You look at landline, you've got to dig the street, 
put the cable, get right of way, and it used to take long time to provide a telephone connection, and it used to cost about $1,000 a line. Today, you can get a telephone connection for less than $50 a line. That has essentially transformed the landscape. Then what does it mean to connect 4 billion people in this world? It has changed the way we look at the world, the way we communicate, the way we socialize. You know how many SMS messages you young people send every day, and how you interact and how my generation interacted. I was born in a country where there were very few telephones when I was a young man. 200,000 phones. Then, when I grew up, there were 2 million phones for 750 million people. I had never used telephone in my life before coming to the US because if someone had a telephone, he was too rich to be my friend. All my friends had no need to talk to anybody who had a telephone. And today, everyone on the street, even in India, has telephones. India has 500 million mobile phones, and India is adding 10 to 15 million mobile phones every month, month after month. Just the sheer logistics of that requires different understanding of technology. So technology is critical everywhere. I just gave an example of telecom. Look at agriculture. The amount of inventions we have had in the agricultural area in terms of seeds, productivity, has really given us all the tools to feed 6.7 billion people today. But we have not used technology for food distribution effectively. So as a result, even in a country like India, where there is a lot of surplus food, people die out of hunger because you can't get to them. You don't know who needs what when, because we have not used technology to really benefit food distribution. Everywhere I look, I find technological interventions to transform our lives. Today, when I look at processes, whether it is in Mexico, India, US, no matter where, I find that the mindset is still that of 19th century. The processes are of the 20th century, and the needs are really of the 21st century. Many times we are using computers to really digitize the existing old processes that don't make sense anymore. So what is really needed today, world over, is to change all of the processes one by one to create new processes that the world needs in the 21st century. I landed in Mexico City yesterday, and all of a sudden there were about 1,000 people in the immigration. We had two forms to fill on the flight one for custom, one for immigration. And then there was a third form to fill for the virus to make sure that you tick in, that you are not sneezing, you don't have running nose, you don't have temperature. And somebody is collecting all these forms. What are they doing with these forms? Who is reading these forms? Is it really necessary to have all these forms today in this day and age? But this is the process we had designed based on the 20th century mindset. So we are collecting thousands and thousands of pieces of paper. The only person, according to me, who benefits from this is the guy who is printing the forms. <laughs> Everywhere you look, you find that there is a need to change. Just look at education. Somehow somebody somewhere decided that it should take four years to get a degree. B.S. or B.A. And the whole world follows that. China takes four years, India takes four years, Mexico takes four years, and U.S. takes four years. And then you have this list of best universities in the world, Harvard and MIT, and everybody wants to copy them. Everybody wants to be like them on the same list. 
Today, I believe education systems are completely obsolete because we don't learn the same way we used to learn 10 years ago. Do we really need to learn all the things we are learning? Do you really need a grade to get out or you need a grade to get in? It's very important to understand. I would rather see a grade to get into something and not a grade to get out of something. Look at teacher today. Teacher spends or his or her time on creating content and delivering content. Today content is already available on the net of all kinds. Delivery could be through variety of sources. A class could sit here and watch on screen a best lecture from open courseware given by a Nobel laureate on physics. Do you really need to modify that lecture? I don't think so, not much. Then the role of the teacher as a result would change to that of a mentor and not of someone who comes with duster, blackboard, chalk, classroom, textbook, exam, grades, certificate. That paradigm needs to be completely changed. Same with health. Every time I go to hospital, and unfortunately I wind up going there more often than I should. You go there, they ask you same set of questions, your name, your social security number, your address, your, you know, same thing. I say, look, I've given this to you 10 times, and it should be in your computer because it's the same hospital. So no, we still have to have it. Then they give you a stack of forms, three forms. Take this for your blood test. Take this for your x-ray. Do I really need all that anymore? Because technology has now changed the need for a lot of these things. So whether it is education or health, governance, everywhere there is a massive requirement to change. How do you get a birth certificate? How do you get land record? How do you apply for admission in school? The learning models are so very different today. And what do you really learn? Do you really need to learn more about some British empire someplace? Do you really need to read all the Shakespeare material? I don't know. I have my doubts at many times. What are we teaching our kids today? Is that really relevant? Does that take them to where they need to go? All our jobs are changing rapidly. Jobs of the 21st century are very different from the jobs of the 20th century. But I don't think we are geared to redefine new jobs and train people for those jobs. I have seen many, many graduates can't read, can't write, can't comprehend. We immediately go into narrow boundaries of specialities. I'm afraid that in many countries, people don't go into maths and sciences anymore. Even if they go into maths and sciences, immediately after they graduate, they want to go into investment banking. Today, the needs are very different. Technology is going to offer so many new solutions. Look at biotech. Genentech, nanotechnology. I was in Munich a couple of months ago, going to the airport, and we happened to be early. On the way, there was a BMW museum. So I said, let's stop here for about 10, 15 minutes and go see what's in the BMW museum. So we go there, two of us, myself and my colleague, and we see a car of the future which has covering material out of nanofiber, which is seamless. In other words, the entire body is of one piece of cloth. Pretty fancy. You have to see it to believe it. So when you open the door, there are no two pieces of metal. There is no metal. 
So when you open the door, it just forms a little crease. And when you close the door, it's again seamless. So when that car gets into accident, the material is such, you get a bump, in 30 seconds it's back to where it was. So now you have material that remembers what is the shape that material has been given. And it always comes back to that shape. Similarly in health areas, there are so many interesting things going on. I know of many people working on all kinds of crazy ideas that look like magic today. But it's going to be reality very soon. I have a friend who says, look, I'm working on a liquid that you will give to a child when the child is born, such that this child, when he eats anything, will produce protein. So it will make protein out of it. So you will not have to deal with hunger 50 years from now. There are people who are growing weeds which grow like wildfire in the ocean. Cut it every day, create pallets, and from these pallets, create a plant for energy. And I've seen it. And you wonder how this weed grows that fast. I mean, you can literally look here and you come back in half an hour and the thing is five times the size. Yeah. Science fiction is almost here in many, many ways. I know of another gentleman who is working on lightning bug. And he says, why is this bug always giving so much energy and lighting? Can I understand the genetic makeup and inject that in the tree so that the trees will light up at night? And it sounds like, again, science fiction. So technology and engineering is really all about problem solving. I see huge opportunities in the next foreseeable future to really solve a lot of new problems. Problems that we have not been able to solve for many years. Problems which relate to things like hunger, poverty, environment, dying species from our animal kingdom. Can we revive them back? So on one hand, technology has given us a lot of prosperity. Infant mortality has decreased. Lifespan has increased. All over the world, there's enough food to feed people. Same technology also has not been able to solve many of the large global problems. And there are many reasons for it. I have my own view of why and what. Not that my view is 100% right. But I strongly believe that part of the problem has been, and part of the solution also has been, the fact that all major technological innovations in the last 50 years have come only from the US. Laser, transistor, software, microprocessors, you name it. All major innovations. And all these innovations have roots in defense and not in human development. As a result, a lot of these technologies are too expensive. At the same time, world over, best brains have been busy solving problems of the rich, who really don't have many problems to solve. As a result, problems of the poor really don't get the kind of talent it requires. So bottom of the pyramid doesn't get the attention. This trend can only be reversed if we begin to think differently and not follow the US model of consumption. Today, the world only follows the US model of consumption. I'll give you a very simple example. And this was told to me by a friend of mine. He said, one of my Indian friends who stayed in America for many years, 
was going home after 15 years to India. And he kept thinking about taking some gifts for his father. So he thought and he thought and he said, what do I give my dad? A very simple man, very unassuming man, highly literate man. So finally he decides to buy a shirt. And goes to his dad and said, dad, I bought a shirt for you from US. So his dad looks at him and he says, son, why did you do that? He said, I already have three shirts. I wear one, I wash one, and what is in the spare? He said, what do I do with the fourth shirt? He said, it doesn't make sense to me that I need fourth shirt. If you look at this from one perspective, you realize that consumption is not the answer. Today, the world gets all excited when people in US have a great shopping season during Thanksgiving or Christmas because it means more work for Chinese and Indians and Taiwanese and Mexicans and everybody else. This model of consumption based economy is not scalable, workable or sustainable. We need to think of new models and this is all connected with technology. This is all connected with how we structure our thinking, our lives. The world today needs in 21st century a whole new model of development. As a layman, I look at Mexico. I come here, I love it. You know, this is like second home. I feel at home here. And I said to myself, with all this talent in this country, somehow it doesn't make sense that the entire country's economy is tied to US only. There is more to this world than US. The world is too big. It's only recently people have been paying attention to China and India. But you can't ignore billion people in India and billion people in China as part of the global community. So you look at export-import data in Mexico and the first thing that hits you is that you export crude oil and you import refined oil. It just don't make sense. Saying, well, well, there's something wrong here. I mean, you got the biggest market in the world next to you. Why would you export crude oil? But there is some logic, probably, which is not really good logic, but there is logic. Yeah. So you look at all these things and you begin to see a different pattern. And I think 21st century offers us unique opportunity. One, to use new technology, to change the lives of the people, to provide growth that is inclusive, and not just for the top of the pyramid, but also for the bottom of the pyramid. Young talent, and new ways of doing things. I keep saying everywhere I get a chance that everything we do today is obsolete. The way we do it, do not make sense. The way I get my visa, the way I enter immigration, the way I apply for school admission, everything when I look around, I say, why are we doing it this way now? It was okay probably 50 years ago. But because that's what we have been used to doing, we keep doing it and we keep it now doing it with computers, same old stuff. Rather than refocusing on redesigning processes. I think technology will continue to enhance lifespan. I guarantee that many of you who are in 20s will live to be 120 and not like us. When I was growing up, I assumed that lifespan is 60. Now it is already 80. And it's going to be 120. If you are a little bit well off, they'll make sure that you don't die because there will be so many new tools and techniques that will be available to you to change your spare parts, to give you better healthy life. That's one stream of technology for health. Similarly, there is a stream of technology for food. We are redesigning food. 
No one ever thought of banana and potato mixed together. That's a new food that people are already looking at. Genetically modified food is a way of life. And you will see more and more of it. Things we have never seen. You will see new animals which look like dog and cat together. It's going to happen. Okay? It's not science fiction anymore. All of this is on one hand going to create new demand on technology, on the other hand will change the landscape of how we live, how we think, how we socialize. Today many people say that the children know how to play with computer, but they don't know how to play with their own neighborhood kids. I can go on and on, but I would like to sort of summarize, so we have a little more discussion, by saying it is good to be in technology. I'm delighted that many of you have decided to study technology as opposed to liberal arts. Not that liberal arts is not important, don't get me wrong. Liberal arts is equally important. But for technology to understand psychology, philosophy, sociology, anthropology is equally important. Because now education is going to be multidisciplinary. The vertical silos of electrical engineer, civil engineer are basically gone. You need to be looking at the horizontal platform in education as opposed to vertical silos. Engineering gives you the ability to think a little more logically because we all tend to think as engineer input, output, delay, feedback, response. All of these things are important in life because everything has input, output, feedback, delay, response. To have systematic thinking, systems level thinking is very critical to solving large problems, small problems. Every problem requires a new level of thinking, new tools, new techniques. And I think what you are studying today in this great university is going to be of great value to you going forward. But you must recognize that education does not stop here. When you graduate, real education begins. All you are given here is basic understanding, basic tools. So don't get too excited after you get your degree and say, I'm done. I think that's when you start learning. You can say, ah, I have a little broader base to understand what I need to learn. Learning is a lifelong process. I'm learning every day, learning new things, interesting things, and recognizing how little I know in life. There is so much to know in this world. No man, no person can really begin to understand even 0.01% of all there is to understand. Our world is so complex, so challenging, so different, that all we can do is begin to expand our horizon as we go along and continue to learn. And science, gives us that background to question things every day. And the day you stop questioning, you stop inventing. So my two cent advice to young colleagues here would be, it's good to have all these tools and degrees from the great university like ETAM, but all it says to you is, you have to start learning after you leave your university. Learning is a continuous process, and this is the beginning of your journey. Exciting journey, don't stop learning, don't stop questioning. These two things will come very handy in life. If you begin to focus on these two, learn all the time, question all the time, life would be very interesting. It won't be boring, I can assure you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sam. Uh, I would like to ask a question regarding an entrepreneur, entrepreneurship point of view. What do you think uh, is a panorama that uh, Mexican technological, te technological entrepreneurs are facing, you know, that we need to deal with the major technological, technological monopolies? 
And in the other, the other question, from your personal successful point of view and as a entrepreneur, what do you think are the key factors that you look into in order to materialize a uh, technological opportunity? As an entrepreneur, I believe first requirement is to recognize that success and failures are part of the same equation. So if you are afraid to fail, you cannot be a good entrepreneur. It is okay to fail. You must learn to celebrate failures. Just don't celebrate successes. It's good to celebrate failures. Risk taking is very important to be an entrepreneur. You don't know how it's going to turn out. So you try 10 things, maybe two will work. But don't try two, and then when they don't work, get disappointed. Entrepreneur always has to explore new frontiers. New frontiers in marketing, costing, product development, design, you know, adaptability. There are too many complex issues, but that's the romance, that's the challenge, is to explore new frontiers. Don't get disappointed when you fail. And as a result, my advice to my entrepreneur friends is, do lots of things. Something will work sometime. Don't give up. And it might work after 10 years and it will work so well that you'll be amazed. Keep at it. Have contagious enthusiasm about what you do. Entrepreneurs are a very special breed of people. They don't want structured life. Eight o'clock, take a car, go to work, nine o'clock, get a cup of coffee, meet your boss, your boss says something, do a little bit of it, don't do most of it, goof off a little bit, you know, have a long lunch. Okay, that's not entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is always on the go. And the motivation comes from within and not from outside. Nobody tells you what to do. You figure out what to do for everybody else beside yourself also. So entrepreneur is always looking for activities and excitement. And entrepreneurs are really special people. It doesn't have to be a billionaire. A street vendor is also an entrepreneur in his own way. Okay. But we talk about technology entrepreneur. There you need to experiment a lot more than street vendor. So willingness to fail is very important. And you don't need to worry about monopoly, not monopoly. Whatever it is, there's just enough room to do new things. Sometimes you just stand on a street like this for 10 minutes and you realize, ah, I can change lots of these things. And you will see opportunities, every one of those. Try 10, two will work. Don't expect more than five to work. That's not a good average in this day and age. So that's my two cents. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Any more questions? First of all, I would like to thank you for coming today to um, enlighten us with your words. Uh, I would like to ask you, a personal question. How did you advert uh, the technological trend that was going on in India at the time that you proposed um, all the changes made right now? Sometimes in life you have to be arrogant. And it is good to have a lot of ignorance. Ignorance is a great asset. Because that tells you, you can do it. If you listen to too many people, you get convinced that you can't do it. So I decided at some point in time that I'm going to fix India's telecom and IT against all the odds. Everybody said it can't be done. I said, that's great. More you tell me it can't be done, more I'm convinced I got to do it. Okay. But that means a lot of sacrifice, 24 hours a day heart attack, bad stories in the newspaper, people following you, 
you know, people criticizing you and you need alligator scheme okay, because everybody's after you and you have this mission, you keep at it. And you have to be passionate about what you do. And things begin to happen. I've always relied on young energy. I mean, young people have this great ability to get things done. Tremendous amount of energy. Somehow it is not capitalized everywhere. So when I started in India, Prime Minister asked me, he said, what do you need? I, I said, I need 500 young people, average age of 23. I don't want to hire anybody who has experience because they are already spoiled. Okay? They'll tell me it can't be done. These 23-year-old guys don't know it can't be done and they'll get it done. So I think that young energy is very important. So all of you, at least those who are young you know, students here, should never take no for an answer. Because your parents and your teachers will tell you things based on their experience and their age, which is of no relevance. You have to explore your world. And you have to learn from your own experiences and failures and successes. If you make up your mind that you want to do something, you can do it. I give you an example of one great entrepreneur in India. He had no education, Dhirubhai Ambani. He, I knew him, he was a good friend of mine, just died a few years ago. He was filling gas in Yemen, Aden. As a young man, while filling gas and selling cloth in the evening, which he will carry on his head and sell it. He said, I'm going to set up a textile mill in India, and I'm going to set up a refinery in India. The guy can't even have a job, but he has this dream. So he comes back to India. Again, starts selling cloth, putting on his head. And someday, somewhere, somebody tells him that there is a textile mill which is up for sale. So he goes to a few friends, gets some money, takes the textile mill, turns it around, goes into synthetic yarn, makes all kinds of stuff. Today, his two kids are each worth 40 to 50 billion dollars. This is in one lifetime. 40 years, one man did it. He had this grand vision. And he had tenacity to think so big, so wild. He was the biggest refinery in the world. And he started everything from scratch, didn't have any education, but he had guts. I remember once he had having discussion with Bactel from the US. And the Bactel guy said, look, we have to send some people for you your company to be trained and we have a problem because our 10 guys who are going to be training are very busy. He said, don't worry about it. You don't bring them here, I'll send my guys there. So Bactel said, do you know how many people we have to train? Thousand. He said, no problem. I'll have two planes loaded, three planes, 747, and my guys will come to US. He thought very differently as an example. He was an entrepreneur. He was not a technocrat. He had no background in anything, except he had courage, guts, an ability to just move on and on. So there are all kinds of, and I'm sure there are many stories like this in Mexico, many stories like this in US, everywhere else. And each of these stories tell us something different, something unique, something worth thinking about, learning. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, you were saying that everything is it's obsolete and that we have to find ways. I mean, we have to find new ways, but hey, okay to uh, fix something that is not broken? Like, is it when I say everything is obsolete, don't take it literally. Okay. But 
believe everything is obsolete. So you have to draw that line. Like getting up in the morning is not obsolete. We have to do that. Okay. Taking a shower every day is probably not obsolete. Okay. So there are certain things which we all do, we'll continue to do, which we have been doing for generations. But the point I'm making is it is time to examine everything we do and then make a decision. Is it worth doing it same way today? That's the point I'm making. Okay. I'm not saying if it is not broken, fix it. No. Don't fix it if it is not broken. But think about it. What you think it is not broken may be really broken. You don't even know. Okay? Because somebody else might come and say, hey, this is broken. Any more questions? Yeah. The last one, so <laughs> make it value. Hi, hello. So, uh, what's, what do you think the path is towards changing these processes, considering the, the, the speed, the overwhelming speed of, of technolo technological change and innovation today? Say it again, I didn't understand it. The, um, it w what path do we have to follow in order to change processes, considering that uh, we can't even breathe without technology changing? Okay, first thing I think is each institution, whether it is education, health, government, income tax department or others, will have to ask this question, saying, do I need to change processes today? And it has to come from the top. You know, you and I can't decide that we want to change the income tax process in Mexico, because we are not in charge of it. Somebody who is in charge of it has to think that way. Okay. But we can at least begin from our area. If you are in your business, you can begin to think of your business processes. If you are a dean of the university, you can think of university processes. If you are teaching a class, you say, how do I teach? Am I doing the right things? I remember we used to have a professor in India who used to take great pride in the fact that his notes had not changed for 20 years. That's not good. But he thought he was a great professor because his notes remained the same for 20 years. Okay, now, how do you convince him that this is no good? You need to go back and learn what has happened in 20 years. Yeah. So it all depends. Each one will have to go within and ask ourselves, what can we do? How can we change? Change our own lives. Sometimes it's difficult to change the lives of your wife, your husband, your children. It's very complicated. Okay? You can't, you want to change the world, but you can't change your own relative. You know, but you keep trying. You know, sometimes you can't change also yourself. You know, but I think the ability to question is very important. I believe in the ability to question everything. And it is okay to question everything. Yeah. And you don't have to be right in life all the time. It is okay to be wrong. It's the whole idea of success and failure. It's okay for me to be wrong on and off. No problem. Never get too excited about celebrating successes. And don't get too disappointed with failures in life. What goes up has to come down, and what is down has to come up. So just take it as it comes, as a journey. Thank you very much. So Sam, thank you. Once again, thank you very much for coming. We prepared you two little presents from part of the students for this talk, no?